Uh, welcome to the ROI on Influencer Marketing Panel. Uh, we've got a great mix of people here uh, to talk about their various experiences and uh, answer your questions. In terms of ROI on Influencer Marketing, you know, there's a lot of stats that gets floated around. You know, you hear the same stats that uh, ROI generates a 10 to 1, R, you know, uh, earn media value. 92% of people trust influencers over their friends. Are these stats real or what is the real ROI that brands can expect to get from influencer marketing? Uh, well, I think it's it's a very ambiguous question because it really comes down to what you define your ROI to be. So depending on the brand you are, depending on where you are in the space, your ROI may be different. My ROI may be awareness because I'm Nike. Uh, but for a smaller brand, the ROI may be actual hardcore sales because if you spend $5,000 and you don't get a return on it, you feel it. So it really comes down to first defining what your ROI is going to be and then back into it and making sure that you're setting KPIs throughout the process or key performance indicators to make sure you're coming close to what you expect to be. And if you're not, you have indicators to help you make yourselves pivot so that you're not at the end of your campaign. You're like, wow, I really got nothing out of this. Yeah, I think trust is a huge uh, component of that. We, we have a side business where we also take what we've learned from building our own Chopper Town brand and actually helping other brands, sort of a boutique agency, a content marketing agency, social agency, where we help them build we basically give them the Chopper Town treatment and we say, look, this is what we did. This is what we've learned over the past 15 years in social. What are your goals? And then you sit down with them and it's a very important, the trust factor between you as the agent or the content create, the person that's hired to create whatever it is you're hired to create. If you're an influencer, then I think it's a very important selling point for your own growth to represent to the brand that A, you're professional and you know what you're talking about, but B, oftentimes the brand doesn't exactly know what they want. It's why they're going to an agency in the first place or they would do it all in-house, right? So they are coming to you. It's important that, that you make them trust you, not only just because, oh, I have X number of followers, but it's, no, I know what your brand needs. I know, I have a plan for you. And if you can do your homework beforehand and actually speak with a brand about ha ha having this plan and it sounds logical and you can defend your points logically, I think brands love that. They, they're like, wow, this is what we need. Like we know we want a presence, but we don't even know what our, o our ROI might be or we don't know what our goal, you know, we think our goals are views. But what does that mean? And if you know that better than they know that and you can put that forward, you're definitely gonna get the job. I think when we initially work with a brand and we're figuring out what the strategy looks like, um, you know, the biggest question is why are you looking at an influencer marketing campaign? What is that going to drive for your brand? And for us at the end of the day, it ultimately comes down to a credibility for a brand. Um, you are going to an expert influencer in their niche because they have a direct microphone to your direct audience and that's who you want to talk to and you need a you know an instrument to talk to that audience and so that's essentially why you're going through an influencer is because you want that credibility for your brand and you want to reach that audience so from that you can then break down to brand awareness downloads for apps whatever it is that your brand ultimately needs to drive the sales sure but i think Coming from an influencer perspective, it has to be a little bit broader, it has to be a little bit more high level, um, and understanding what an influencer really brings to the table, and that's what we've seen in the most successful campaigns. You know, I think you bring up a, a good point that it's understanding what an influencer really brings to the table. You know, there's a lot of different metrics that you could measure ROI by. Likes, views, installs, conversions, sales, revenue, brand lift, media value, I mean, the list goes on and on and on and on. Is there one particular metric that influencers shine at? And how should brands be thinking about that key KPI that they should be looking to optimize around? Average engagement. Yeah. Put it this way. Uh, if someone has 100,000 followers and they're getting 1,000 likes per post, they suck. 
It's that simple. If, uh, you know, you look at Selena Gomez, right? She has over 100 million followers on social media, but she's only getting three and a half million average likes per post in North America. And if you break down that audience, what you're actually looking at is, uh, you know, 25% of the audience lives in the United States. About 60% of the audience is female. And if you really break it down further, that means she's getting an average engagement level of three to 400,000 women uh, in North America per post. That being said, very influential, but how much is that gonna cost you? which is why I think we're seeing such a big interest in micro-influencers now. Absolutely. Yeah, again, there's not like a, a, a single metric that, that we'll look at to, to really work with clients to say this is the one thing that's definitely going to be the, the end-all, be-all success metric. I think it's going to really depend on what a client's going to do. So, for example, if it's a challenger brand and they're really trying to, to increase their share of voice or they're trying to get their brand awareness out there, um, what we'll do is, is craft kind of a media exposure plan because, again, we're not really relying much on the influencer's organic presence. While that's great, it helps build uh, hopefully an authentic relationship with that audience. We're really working with the influencers to help uh, create content that the brand is then going to use through through our media plans. So a lot of that's going to be, whether it's through Facebook or Instagram or, or Twitter, we're going to put a specific brand study behind it or a conversion study behind it to really measure what's the exact lift in the, in the audience that we're trying to reach. And then from there, with the next campaign, we start to tailor um, based on what that, that result was. And, and what, what kinds of things do those brand studies look at? They're not as scientific as, as, as you'd like, but I'm sure we've all been on Facebook and you scroll through your feed and all of a sudden you get a question that's like, have you seen a brand, have you seen a, an ad from Brand X? Uh, when did you see it? Did you remember it? Or did you just remember it because we told you? So it, it's basically like unaided awareness, awareness, um, and then you have your control. So it's, you have a set price that you have to hit on a media, media spend and, um, and then hopefully that at least gives you enough input to get that brand lift over your control. Uh, and uh, we, we actually find a lot of our clients won't engage further with influencer marketing if they're not hitting certain metrics. Yeah, I think for us, um, one of the primary key indicators is, is average engagement, engagement rates. Um, it will give you a good point of, um, you know, how much you want to spend for an influencer because some campaigns you're working on, you're working with one influencer, some you're working with 100. Um, you have a budget that's given to you either by your boss or by the brand that you're working with for us, for the agency. So we need to work out how we can best split up that pie if we're working with multiple influencers and one of the first things we look at is what's the reach and then what's the engagement rate because if we're looking at someone that has 500,000 followers with an engagement rate of 3% then and they want uh, you know let's just say $5,000 for a post well we could probably look at somebody with 250,000 followers with an 8% engagement rate and they want I don't know, what did I just say they wanted? Um, $500 a post. Then that's obviously going to be a better return on investment because you're spending less, you're getting the same audience reach and engagement. Um, but then again, you kind of need to look at all of the other aspects as well. Um, so I don't, like, it's not a clear cut formula of like X plus Y equals X, or no, whatever, math. <laughs> <laughs> not my strongest point. Um, but at the end of the day, it is like there's a mathematical aspect as well as a creative aspect. Absolutely. Um, you know, w working with influencers, you're kind of subject to whatever, uh, you know, if they're not willing to do a particular promotion or willing to, uh, you know, promote a particular brand, you can't, you can't exactly work with them. The, the largest, the actual, the, the, in terms of the most spend on a campaign we ever tracked ever, it was for a brand called FanDuel, and they actually ran the entire campaign on a CPA basis. They spent millions, um, many, many millions of dollars and it was entirely on a CPA basis where they paid influencers just a, a straight dollar amount per install. You know, is this a model that other brands could look at or is it something that, you know, brands shouldn't consider trying? I'm very anti the affiliate program. Um, I'm <laughs> hands up, stand by that. Um, I think it, it requires the influencers to put a lot of work up the out front with 
without any expectation of being paid for it. Um, we are really big proponents of paying influencers um, and paying them fairly because we're now in a day and age where um, this industry is the wild, wild west out there. People are asking for absorbent amounts of money and some people are not. Um, there is no standardization at all um, from the campaigns that we're working with across various different verticals. Um, and so trying to find somewhat of a standard pay rate for an influencer, um, it's, it's never going to be perfect, um, but it's something that we're trying to sort of figure out via different formulas. And affiliate programs, um, I think they're great from a brand perspective, and I understand why a brand wants to do it, because they offer a promo code every time someone buys something, then the influencer gets a dollar. Um, it's, it's really putting the risk of the brand and the brand's product on the avenue that they want somebody to speak about their product positively, authentically and organically. Um, and I don't think that's fair. I think if it's your business, if it's your brand, it's your product and you want to get it out there, then you need to front for it. Um, you can't put that risk on somebody else. Absolutely. I kind of tend to believe that it's just another tool in the toolbox. Um, some of the most successful campaigns you've seen in modern me marketing have an affiliate aspect to it. I mean, even Tom Brady got paid per UG. Uh, people were laughing at that deal first when it first happened, but my first boss out of college is the one who did that deal, and they made a lot of money. Um, that being said, I think it's something that's a part of the deal. Um, I do agree with you. I think it kind of does cheapen the relationship a little bit if the first thing you're approaching someone with is a, you know acquisition opportunity that being said if it's someone like FanDuel they're paying an obscene amount of money if I'm an influencer with 10,000 followers I might take that roll of the dice but if I really look at social media as a way to monetize and live my life then I'm probably not going to want to do that if I want to do something and that's again a component of of the deal like also I don't know if you guys know about this but obviously you can do a royalty applied towards a guarantee so you can give someone you know 15k and say I'm not going to pay you anything until I make x amount of money back once you reach x amount of dollars and you start making a royalty afterwards so at least the influencer feels they got something up front and that's it and then they can make a royalty afterwards and uh, you know as I'm sure you guys will would agree with are incentivized to continue to do more and more potentially um, because they're making a nice dollar on it so again I don't think it's a wrong thing to do I just think you have to know the scenario uh, and want to include it and the way you're gonna include it in the deal and also understand the influence that you're speaking to to see if that would be something that might offend them because if you approach someone really big and say I just want to pay you for a filler they're gonna tell you peace out bro yeah and I think that can work with with celebrity marketing um, one of the things I'm interested in, and we haven't tested it yet, it just launched, uh, is, is kind of Amazon's marketplace with their influencer uh, program that, that's launching right now where brands can't work directly with Amazon, but influencers can, and then you'll get your unique Amazon link. So anything that you sell, you click on, well, you can click on this link, and it has all of the influencers' recommended products. Um, while that's, that may not be right for everyone, it'll be interesting, I think, to see how that goes. I mean, Twitch is doing the same thing where they're allowing all of their uh, kind of like key voices who are playing these games online to then sell the product. I'm not such a huge fan of that at the moment, but we'll see how that develops. The Amazon Marketplace thing I'm a bit more excited about because as you work with specific influencers, uh, you might be able to get a little more prominence with that, uh, with that brand. And we use Amazon that way. So we, we have, because we have film properties, so we have our library on Amazon Digital, so it sells for transactional, it sells for rental, and it's on Amazon Prime. But what we also did was we created an affiliates account so that not only are we generating revenue through the films themselves being watched or bought, but we are gener generating another percentage because we're actually driving the traffic to them. So rather, be, rather than just go, hey, watch my movie, you go, hey, watch my movie, and every time you watch, I get an extra 5%, so you're actually increasing your own royalty on Amazon Prime, little tip. And I think Amazon's been really clever at that, and we work with a lot of um, bloggers that have um, you know, on their websites whenever they do a story and they have their affiliate Amazon link and it automatically populates products that you can buy through Amazon through that link. I think that's great. I mean, that's not to me an affiliate program. I mean, it is, but for me, an affiliate program with an influencer is when uh, a jacket company comes in and says, hey, we want to sell 20,000 jackets on your platform. We want you to wear it. We want you to post about it. Um, and we'll pay you for every sale you get. That's the affiliate side that I don't agree with. I was 16 years old in my first business. We sold hats and I gave free hats out to bloggers and we ended up selling 
hundreds of thousands of hats just giving away to, to bloggers. Is influencer marketing, this was seven years ago, is influencer marketing uh, something that uh, is only, except, only something big brands can take advantage of or is there room for smaller brands to get involved and, and get an ROI on it? There's plenty of room for smaller brands to get involved and get an ROI. I think that's where you know platforms like ours come into play, where you need technology for that because they can't afford, no offense, to go hire an OMD or a, a big agency to do that. We're cheap. <laughs> um, but uh, but I think yeah, hundred percent. I think you know one area that. Um, that can really take advantage of influencers that I would love to see more people do is, you know, hospitality. Um, you're offering an experience. It's, you can barter a lot in that case. You can offer free food. You can offer an environment. I think some of those successful campaigns that have happened recently have been a combination of mostly barter and some and some payment. Um, and I think that smaller brands, you know, again, the, the thing with smaller brands is the hard thing about working with smaller brands is they literally want to know how much the cucumber and the salad cost because if they don't hit their number, they're going to feel it really hard. So that's a, you got to manage expectations the entire way. You got to really do your homework and do your research. You can't afford to be lazy. Um, you can't afford to take risks and not get a reward out of it. That's why, again, I think this panel is so intelligent about ROI and KPIs because if you don't set KPIs throughout your campaign and your campaign doesn't run well at the end, that's your fault. You didn't give your chance the ability to understand where the pitfalls were. And again, that comes from doing your research and really understanding your audience and understanding how to identify them and reach them. I think, oh, sorry. Um, I think the, the beauty of influence marketing is it, it's completely scalable. Um, you could be a small business and have a couple of thousand dollars to spend on an influence campaign. Then, you know, we take that and we go, okay, this is how many influencers we can work with, this is the type of reach, this is the targeted demographic that we want to target, or we can go to these million dollar contracts and they say we want to work with some of the biggest, you know, Joey Grisifa or, you know, some of the biggest influencers that are out there, then they have the budget to do that. But, I mean, we as an agency, we work with, with brands right across the board, um, from the very small ones right through to the bigger ones, um, because it's, you can. One of my top pieces of advice that I would give a small business, a small brand, a small business owner, is you have got to find money for advertising and marketing. Yep. You have to. It, you're not running a business if you're not paying for some kind of advertising. You're just not. I mean, you, you can do organic all day. I mean, we grew our page organically to, I don't know, it was like 1.5 million likes completely organically and now we pay because Facebook demands that you pay you, we still get a lot of organic but we pay now and that was getting to that point mentally was such a huge struggle for us because it is a small business you know it's not making millions per year it's a niche distribution company and so but once we got past that point of understanding that we could then explain that to other people as well so now when we're working with a new client a, a, a smaller brand it's part of the deal they have to agree to a certain amount of money for a straight ad spend because the other thing that you're getting is we use Facebook advertising not only just with an ROI against the ads, but once you get in there, the data that you can generate for your business, because now you're a paying ad, same thing with Amazon. If you run, Amazon now allows you to run ads within Amazon. It's very similar to the way that you run ads within Facebook. It's incredible. It's incredible, and you're within that ecosystem running ads and targeting them and fine-tuning. Once you learn the process of fine-tuning a Facebook ad, you can turn that right around, hand it to your content people, it's probably yourself, you know, could be, but whoever's making your content socially, you're organic, you're looking at the ad and you're like, look, we just tested it, we spent 50 bucks and we had five different images and we did an A-B test against all the images. This one won, why did it win? The ads platform will tell you, you paid 50 bucks for that information that organically, how long and how many posts do you have to do to learn what works? And there you paid 50 bucks and it told you what works turn it around and now change all your content to look that way. I think Boom. that point is critical. 
I don't think enough people do that in influencer marketing. You mentioned it earlier, putting a paid budget behind, you know, amplification budget behind influencer posts. If you have a post that's working for you, if you have a post that's actually driving results, why not try to get more and figure out how to optimize it, how to, you know, get insights, uh, you know, split testing data for future ad campaigns. I think it's a really good point. Well, and I was just going to say one of the one of the trends that I think we'll probably start exploring on a large scale, but I feel like this could definitely apply to, to any size. Is um, instead of the, the pay for play model, uh, I'm not an influencer, as his data uh, told me 15 minutes ago, um, uh, with 34 Twitter followers. So much we'll <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I would I would imagine that um, you know there's a lot of information as an influencer that you just don't have access to that uh, companies of let's say OMD size can just pay thousands of dollars a year to have access so versus paying you let's say X amount for doing a certain type of campaign I feel like there could be a, a value swap where we have access to all of your audience data exactly the best places that it's going to perform within media how you can expand your followers how you can expand into new maybe uh, sectors and verticals that we know your audience will also appreciate and so then that audience could do it so maybe with a smaller uh, agency who at least has some access to, to some of those tools or, or smaller brands uh, I would imagine that is valuable information for an influencer and they may be willing to participate in a program uh, that could be low cost but they'll get value in return. I think that's a great point. You know, anytime you can build value with an influencer and a mutual exchange of value, it's a, it's definitely a win-win. So I have one last question, and then we'll we'll start taking some questions from the audience. You know, one of uh, one of the most interesting things that we've seen analyzing you know thousands of posts is that the exact same influencer can have radically different costs depending on if they're managed through their MCN, if they're managed through their MCN's MCN, if they're managed through an agent through an MCN through an MCN, if they're going through an agency, if they're working directly. The, how, what is the level of transparency on pricing? How does working through an MCN or an agency impact the ROI? And is these you know potentially large margins that you know the MCNs take? Is this something brands should be considered and uh, thinking about? Well, this is actually it's a really good question. Um, so. Uh, it's kind of a little bit of a long answer, but let me just kind of explain it a little bit. So the the talent world has transcended dramatically, right? You know, for example, back in the day, you couldn't call William Morris or an ICM or UTA or any of the big three letters with a $5,000, $10,000 deal. Good luck they ever call you back. Good luck if they pick up the phone. Good luck if they want to talk to you. Now they have to take those calls because that guy that's on Discovery Channel and he's got 100,000 followers and they're making their money off of the TV show through him, he's like, where's my deal at? So he, he's got to take that call now. That being said, when you have a middleman in, in play, there comes there should come a certain amount of guarantees with that middleman, right? For example, coordinating contracts, legality. So you're paying a premium for a middleman to do certain things. Now, whether that middleman is really greedy or not is something a completely different conversation. But there should be a certain level of comfort that you should have with dealing with middlemen, uh, in the sense of that you you should know that if you're working through someone for someone, that they're going to get it done and get it done well. That being said, this is where the whole wild west for micro influencers comes into play because I think people now are afraid to just talk to people there's no buffer in the room now there's no one to say oh well you know yeah you gotta you gotta change that to add and spawn that you, you didn't do this right oh the, the the sweater's red it should be blue there's no one in the middle you got to deal with it yourself and i think people and marketers honestly have just gotten lazy they don't want to have to deal with it everyone likes to just send an email you know you got to pick up the phone you got to get your elbows dirty you got to get your hands greasy that's where we are right now um that's just my honest opinion of where i think uh you know they're both needed um, but there is something to be said about having an effective middleman in the in the equation. Yeah, we you know on, on that point, uh, I, I I also don't mean to, to devalue you know the weight of uh, that middleman. We've actually seen that historically some of the the best performing influencer posts were managed through an agency, and they actually made up for the margin that they charged with better creative content, better distribution, better strategy. You know, plus all the legal headaches they removed, and so I think there is value. But you know, just from an ROI perspective, it's I think it has to be considered. I think uh, what we're seeing in the industry now, particularly this year, in the past couple of months, uh, this industry is shifting dramatically um, from the MCNs, from makers crashing, um, DreamWorks 
Starbucks is buying in some of the bigger agencies. Um, brands can get in if the agency is transparent. I mean, it comes down to the brand. If you're working with an outsourced party or an agency in any capacity, you need to have you know the guts to ask them where is our money going what does it look like and the agency um, you know should be able to say you know this is what the project fee is this is what's going out to an influencer this is what's coming on hard costs um, and they should be able to present that to you um, what we're seeing from a lot of these big MCNs um, and the ones that are falling is because their overheads are far too high for them to be a sustainable business. Um, we had a massive campaign that we were working on earlier this year um, with some of the really big influencers and we're an agency, we represent our own roster, but we're also working directly with the other agencies because they have the talent that we want to work with. Um, and I was floored by some of the quotes that I was getting to work with these influencers, um, knowing that we're on the inside track with other influencers in that capacity, and knowing that the markups are, you know, between 40 to 60 percent um, of what the influencer is actually making. Um, so I really put it down to the, to the onus on the brand or the product or whoever wants to work with the influencer. Do some research. Um, go to an agency that you think is going to be transparent with you. Be open um, and really show you the books because it, it's the wild west. Absolutely. Yeah, I would say that the agencies, um, some of them, their days are very numbered because they've been. The only the only person with the in in the room for such a long time, and now you know different kinds of tools, you know, like Jonathan's and like you know the people they 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 have. There are ways. For instance, we did a deal where we did d direct outreach to a brand, developed a relationship, but the brand already had a contract with the media buying agency, so they're contracted so the money's there so they send us back to the media agency well the, the media agency basically messed it up I mean they you know fucked it up you know what I mean like pardon me sorry <laughs> but I mean they did they got in the middle and started trying to negotiate so hard on us but likewise they were doing the brand a disservice because the brand and us had such a nice chummy relationship that it it drove it down you know what I mean so we got into a huge argument with the, them the brand stepped in and basically took the agency and said stop talk stop messing this up and then we started talking directly again and it turned out that you know the numbers that the agency had been giving the brand were not accurate and different kinds of things and so we so as a, as a small influencer or a, 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 a you know an individual entity like you might be a small business you can talk directly to brands you, you can go around an agency or pat, you can develop your own intel you can develop your own relationship with a brand agencies are great in as much as if they are reliable they can they can speed that up for you and they're worth their commission if they can really get you you know different kinds of activations but if they're not getting you at any activations you should be doing your own brand outreach because people will pick up the phone nowadays a brand will pick up the phone to talk to you if you've got something to say so so coming at it from i guess uh, from from our perspective uh so so we are the media agency that would have done that much better i would i would probably imagine um we don't deal directly with influencers so just because of the the, the, the size and scope of the contracts that we generally deal with um we're very very much into more of the programmatic influencer network so uh we probably i probably chat with at least five different ones every day and i agree to some point that most of these Influencer networks are probably going to be going away or being consolidated or purchased by large holding companies just because there's there's way too many of them at, at the time. But we'll work with those that have unique offerings. So um, uh, I won't I won't throw free PR to I guess too many people, but uh, there's there's certain networks that can provide uh, or that have like let's say unique relationships with Watson. Right, so our fun Watson AI buzzword. Uh, they're they're able to do amazing psychographic and behavioral analysis of influencer content and of brand content, and then do very seamless and, and great matchings uh, where we can get a, an amazing influencer list matched up with the tone that the brand wants to set. And so we'll uh, we'll work with them. So I would just say that. Uh, but there's not a lot of loyalty there just because I would imagine as an influencer, I mean, nobody's under an exclusive contract uh, or they shouldn't be. Um, every network that we work with, we work with them because they have a specific offering, not because they can get us a certain influencer because most every influencer is going to be 
working with everybody. Absolutely. So lots of great uh, talent up here to answer your questions, but I want to hear from you guys. You know, what types of influencer campaigns are you guys running? What sort of ROI are you looking to get? What questions do you have about influencer marketing? Yes, go ahead. I about it I think some of the most successful campaigns that have been run recently on social media have been on Instagram um, through the story feed. You can directly attach yourself to a website or a site directly for purchase. Um, so if you're if you're able to, you know, again, it's, it all comes down to just you know being a perpetual student. I hate when someone says they're an influencer expert. That just makes me cringe inside. You can't be an expert because it's not over. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's just, it's just, it's still going. You have to, yeah, it's consistently evolving. So you have to be a perpetual student to understand what the best tactics are because they're going to change. Like right now, 1990 is probably the most effective way to run a campaign, period. If you don't know what 190 is, you need to learn that ASAP. Because if you don't, you don't know what you're doing. 1990. Um, that's the right model to work for influencer marketing. Now, but a year from now, who knows, another platform may pop up, maybe a new Musical.ly, a new Vines, who knows? It may change things again. So as of now, um, I would say, um, depending on how big of a brand you are, uh, you should do, ha you know, I would say 30% of your budget should be towards awareness and 70% should, should go towards either getting direct sales or uh, increasing foot traffic if you're a brick and mortar store. Yeah, and I think uh, you were asking, is, is, influent is, is Instagram great for better for awareness versus yeah, kind of other conversion driving? I've dealt with both. Um, I just find that hard sales are sometimes awkward as the influencer to enact versus an awareness campaign. So if you have 100,000 followers, you're getting paid for 100,000 eyes on their brand, essentially, is how I kind of view it. Yeah, I, w I would say, so we would not use influencers on, uh, at least with a number of the brands that, that, that we, we've touched, we don't use the influencer content to necessarily drive conversions through the ad units that Instagram provides that you can either shop now, learn more, um, visit a website. It's uh, it, in, Unless we're using influencers as content creators and then building that into our ads and then that is what's representing our, our shop now type thing, um, we like Instagram as an awareness play. Uh, we also like it in conjunction with Facebook so we can get optimizations on our media spend back and forth. Uh, and same with influencer content. We like to, if we can, find an influencer who's on both platforms and then we'll put media behind and then the algorithms uh, basically optimize to whether you see it on Instagram or Facebook. I think it also really depends on what the campaign is and you know, Instagram is a visual platform. Um, there's a lot of technology brands that prefer Twitter um, because it's, you know, it's it's the content that you're putting out, um, who, what the vertical is, and um, you know, all of those aspects that go into it. Absolutely. So I have a question. Go ahead. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe everybody will be interested in this question, but it just occurred to me that, and I was waiting to see what you said, but I haven't heard Snapchat mentioned once yet. And it's what time? Ooh, great point. All day. Yes, absolutely. Nobody. Nope. Actually, nobody mentioned YouTube either. Really. Yep. What? What's up? You think Zuckerberg? No, I just one. I want to throw that out there because I think from a brand, where are they? From a brand perspective, um, we run campaigns with Snapchat and Instagram Stories, and brands don't like it because it disappears after 24 hours. Um, Snapchat has some of the highest engagement rates. Brands don't like it because it's not forever content. Um, even with influencers on Instagram and Facebook, we have to put in contracts that the, the content stays up for a certain period of time uh, because a lot of influencers will take them down. Uh, they get their paycheck and they pull it off. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot of aspects that you need to look at when you're going into the campaigns. But um, I think Snapchat, yeah, it's it's a cool platform. Um, I hate it, personally. <laughs> no, I think a lot of people hate it. I'm not trying to down Snapchat. I'm just saying nobody brought it up. But it's, know, fun. It's but fun. likewise, like Facebook used to be, all, the, all of them used to be a real, like Snapchat, Facebook, when you posted it, they used to say, oh, your highest engagement is in the first yeah. two hours. Does everybody remember that? Yeah. And, and then it, it extended out and it extended out and extended out. And now we see such a long tail on content on Facebook 
it's just they changed the way that it drips, right? It drips out to your audience. Snapchat is still in that immediacy thing, you know, Twitter too, but they've changed to be more Facebook-like so that you, you'll you see posts that you know were posted a day ago or two days ago, but it just came into your feed because the algorithm determined you probably will like it. And, you know, it's yep. good at it. You probably do like it, you know, unless it's news, of course. But. You know, I'd, I'd probably say Snapchat while uh, while generally has been considered more of a younger audience, uh, I think their largest growing base right now is, is skewing older, so pushing that that 35 years. So so Snapchat definitely still has a place in our marketing mix. It's it's definitely not a forgotten thing. We use it with a ton of our entertainment clients. You still get as um, you know as, as we were saying, uh, fantastic engagement on there. I think. Um, They've been making great strides because they've been forced to make great strides. Uh, one, with, with Facebook and Instagram copying everything, but two, because Facebook had such a massive, massive issue recently with a lot of the transparency and then miscalculating results. Uh, Snapchat's done a fantastic job of building relationships with, um, with third parties that now Facebook has, but like with Moat and people that are better measuring your, uh, your activity. Uh, and, and I just think that that platform is, is still continuing to innovate, especially with the fact that all of the content deals they sign are generally exclusive too. So whether it's uh, SNL that's you know doing their channel on Snapchat, they're doing exclusive Snapchat content. Um, you know they'll they'll probably work with partners like FIFA or whatnot to provide unique content coming up. So I think it's still valuable. It's just a matter of how you can put it in your mix. Absolutely. More questions from the audience. Yes, go ahead. So we've talked a lot about social channels, but the growth of podcasting or other long form tools, certain print media even, or bloggers. Talk about that as an influencing opportunity or is that PR realm? I'm, I'm fascinated by podcasts. We I'm really fascinated by it. Yeah, it's a big one. Uh, we still work with a lot of influencers that are bloggers. Um, you know, that was sort of the first point of where they started. Um, they grew their following on their online platform, social media kind of blew up in their face, so they jumped on board and, um, you know, it, they're two di very different because social media really spawned a whole star of different influences in and of itself, um, whereas the bloggers that come in from that traditional blogging space had to have social media in order to promote their blogs um, and vice versa. So uh, we're still working with a lot of bloggers um, and podcasts are a big thing. Um, I find they're a little bit more specific to really targeted niches, um, health and fitness particularly are more in the blogging podcasting space um, where you're getting this younger generation coming through that have got their fame from Instagram um, or YouTube even um, but you know fashion and lifestyle yeah you'll still see the fashion blogs but you're probably going to find more of them more active on their social media absolutely questions yeah yes uh, so what are the conversion rates because what I'm hearing is that I think this, this, this the average conversion. I think the last statistic was a 2.8 percent or something from a social media campaign, and you can expect that in results. I would take those with a grain of salt. Um, they might yeah. know more about it from the platforms, but it's it's really dependent on each campaign. We've we've tracked just under a hundred million dollars worth of influencer spend across about forty thousand or so influencers, and uh, and don't don't shoot the messenger here, but it turns out that about seven. 70% of influencers actually don't generate an ROI for the brand from a conversion standpoint. When, when they're actually using like, a, like it's an e-commerce sale or an app install, like seven or eight out of 10 actually are neutral or negative. Then about one out of 10 are just barely positive. And then that other one out of 10 range from like a 2X ROI to like, there's a handful of influencers out of like the 30 or 40,000. There's like about a hundred of them that consistently generate 30 to 40X on their money um, to the point where I actually made, uh, I don't know if I should do this or not, but like side money promoting things through them uh, because they just consistently generate 30 or 40 X ROI whenever they're in on a campaign. And so um, those particular influencers absolutely love things like CPA deals because they just absolutely destroy it. I'll make, I, one of them made $710,000 on a CPA deal, which is absolutely insane. Conversion rate on average, you're actually spot on. We see the conversion rate out of uh, that $94 million in campaigns is 
percent on whatever the brand set their conversion rate metric as, but it, the variance on that number is tons and tons and tons of zeros and uh, a very small number of 10 percent that, that take up the average. I think what you just touched on is what we're seeing right now, which is essentially the nucleus of the gold rush of micro-influencers. A lot of ants can equal an elephant, and elephants are expensive. Um, you know, I think that the the uh, that's why you're also seeing you know these MCNs and these and Snapchats of the world moving more towards being content players and distributors and, and the new Paramount Pictures of the world as opposed to being someone that represents talent makes money off of them. Um, I think that as a marketer, I'd rather spend you know uh, ten thousand dollars on a hundred influencers than ten thousand dollars on one influencer, um, and then see what happens based off of the research that I've done to assert those people with the right influencers that have an audience. That that's interested in in what I potentially may be selling uh, see which ones responds the best a B test a little bit and check out the content and then decide okay wait a second you know I didn't realize that actually this market of 19 to 25 year olds that are Hispanic in uh, you know Midwest actually really have a big affinity for this product and you may not learn that unless you take the necessary steps to measure that accordingly um, and I think that's what Mike why micro influence is just such a smart place to be right now because you can make those rolls of the dice is a little bit uh, a little bit more carefully. I, I completely think that's point spot on. And tools like Hyper are great at searching micro influencers and providing that that insights as well. Yes, question. Just for you and then you jump. Uh, so, how did the CPA campaigns work? How, what were you thinking? Like, like actually, like a URL or an app install, like. In a bio or something. Um, most of the CPA campaigns are, are YouTube and uh, Facebook, and Twitter is not so much anymore. So you're boosting those, and you're, you have, you're doing some paid... We, New York Reach doesn't do any, any actual stuff. We just, like, we work with the big advertisers that pump millions of dollars in and then connect to all of their, you know, enterprise software via lots of APIs and just give them the, the funnel visualization so they can actually figure out their attribution methods and their attribution models and stuff like that. So we just, we just look at the data for them. But, uh, yeah. I, I would love all day to have 100 influencers. How do you work with 100 for $10,000 versus one for 10000 Easy, gotta have options. You have to treat influencers like a commodity, unfortunately. And the only way to do that is by having technology to be able to do that effectively. Um, so like for example, you know, not to make this a sales pitch, but at Hyper, you can reach out to we have over 10 million influencers globally available on our platform. For every no, there's to be 100 yeses ready to go. You, oh, you don't want it? Okay, move on to the next. Oh, you don't want it? Okay, move on to the next. Better yet, I can even, uh, you know, let's say someone says, oh, I want Kim Kardashian. Oh, great, you got a million dollars? You don't? Okay, great. So here are other really small Kim Kardashians from an audience perspective you can be working with. And that's where I think everything's going. Don't get me wrong, there's always going to be a need for, you know, the unbox therapies of the world, the Kim Kardashians of the world. But I think what you're seeing right now in media, which I think the coolest thing that's happened in advertising this year was the Silk commercial DJ Khaled, Silk Milk. I don't know if you guys saw that. Um, if I'm an advertising agency, I'm scared because he shot it on Snapchat and they ran it on TV. Where was the production? Where was the creation? team where was the bougie guy who was like oh it needs to be purple and this and that didn't happen that's also fees that they don't have to spend now to be able to run that it was dj call it and snapchat and they ran it on tv and i think that's where you know that's where the one the nine and the 90 are important because now for example let's look at selena gomez face of pantene I don't have to do a full, you know, renewal with Selena Gomez now. I can just do a small reuse with her, pick up that option, and distribute that content through a hundred micro influencers now that are a quarter of the price. I just saved myself a lot of money. So again, there will always be a need for the ones, but I think the real power right now and the way the space is is in in the nineties. Hyper has essentially programmatic influencer buying. No, we're, we're not programmatic. We take the IMDB approach, where we provide you with all the contact information and audience demographics so you can make the best decision for yourselves. And then uh, in a week, we're rolling out our outreach tool, which will allow you to literally mass email, you know, as many people as you want directly um, to get their awareness, uh, interest and opportunity, and then categorize those interests, kind of like things we've all been familiar with, like AIM or ICQ. Um, that way you're able to really see, oh, this person wants, this person doesn't want it. Uh, but again, that works for a certain caliber of influencer. You know, you can't do that with a B-level influencer or a C-level influencer. There's probably a manager, a momager, or someone in the mix that's going to be in the middle. But for the micro, for the teeny tiny guys, 50,000, 100,000 and below, 
I mean, that's what it's really suited for. And again, that number may change next year. Maybe micro next year is 75,000, 80,000. I mean, as social increases. It seems like there's, been a lot of, there's still going to be a lot of back and forth. It's not truly pragmatic that I, I, I would deploy $10,000 through five people or not. Well, I mean, we. I, mean, I like the analogy. Yeah. The elephant and the ant, but I, I yet to see it. As someone who buys these technologies for Disney, I'm, I'm looking for that. Well, we, we just did it actually with uh, Joe Boxer. Um, we helped them run an extremely effective campaign. I can't disclose the budget, but it was a quarter of what you would think it would be for the awareness and the success of the campaign for the holiday season. We also did it with uh, Comb and Clearvia. They launched a new product um, that actually prevents you from having a hangover. It actually works. I'm not even going to lie. It really works. Um, and we sold out on Amazon every time because we... A, we know how to negotiate and help them negotiate. So if we know an influencer is asking for X, we're like, no, 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 don't pay them that, move on. And B, is software doing that or you're doing this? You know, our, our, our account managers are doing that. They're advising. Yeah, yeah we, we, we built a programmatic solution. We ran two and a half million dollars through, we candled it. It was, I mean, we have, we, I studied CS at Stanford. We had expert engineers across the way to build the product, build the product, you know, nailed the workflow, but the, the, the human, human element, element was, was yeah. we couldn't quite get it automated. Whoever figures out micro influencers <laughs> and remember yeah. the human well, I, I personally don't think <laughs> programmatic is going to happen for a while. Um, and because of that, because it's people. You know, the reason why programmatic worked for websites was because it's a website. Um, asking someone to take over my page and post on my page that I post stuff about my kids and my parents on, a different feeling. Now, I do think what's going to happen is, is that over time, as more and more people come on social social media, you know, numbers start going higher and higher, then you're going to start having kind of like these nano shopper influencers that could be programmatic, you know, talking about the PTA mom with 20,000 followers, you know, those types of influencers for sure. But the higher you go, the less likely that's going to happen. Yeah. Full screen used to have, I'm sorry, full screen used to have something, I don't know, kind of like this where, yeah, right. They tried, they, they had, they did a, what was it called? Guerrilla marketing. Uh, not gorilla like but gorilla marketing and they would they they would identify within their own mcn a certain number of influencers people that had sub you know x number of subs and then they would mass email them an opportunity and they said hey we've got a hundred dollar per person opportunity if you plug that i mean they gave it a good shot but yeah. i think there's I, they're still doing <laughs> some of that manually they still have the software but i again i think like I mean, we we uh, we couldn't do it, and and we we spent a million dollars trying to develop it, and two and a half million in campaign budget, and still couldn't figure it out. So, hope maybe someone. And, and that's will. because I think it's you know it's people. Yeah. How are you managing your platform? Like, how do you keep the you know the good influencers in, the bad influencers mm -hmm. out? And how are you differentiating between someone like an agency who's going out doing this custom for you, vetting it, creating a relationship, plugging you guys together? Well, uh, you know, um, every single person here could be a client. Um, she could be using our reports to, you know, better identify and sell talent she's working with. Um, he can be using it to make sure he's working with the right people. You know, Hyper is unique in the sense that uh, we have a little bit of something for everyone. You know, we have, you know, Next Models and DBA as clients. They use our reports to better sell their talent. We have LVMH, Calvin Klein, Equinox, you name it, using it to make sure their vendors are actually suggesting to them the right influencers, not just a list of people and understand why. So, so to get to your question, you know, about how we maintain quality is we don't we don't allow someone onto our platform that doesn't have a minimum of 2,500 followers. Um, we also do not recognize someone influential if they have not had an active post in the past 30 days. Um, and and that's, that's our criteria. We continue to crawl and find more and more influencers and bring them into our network um, and provide our, our clients with as many options as possible so they can consolidate their spending and treat them like a commodity. Cool. I think, just to jump in on that, um, we do work with platforms similar to theirs for various, um, not necessarily for targeting influencers and outreach, but for monitoring, reporting data that we can't get from. Um, you know, often we have to go to the influencer and say, hey, can you send us the demographics in your insights report for the past month? Mm -hmm. um, it gets a little tiring after a while, and so that's the information that we need from that. Um, but we are in a business of working with humans, and um, you know, we saw in the, the late 90s, early 2000s that companies were trying to automate and program hiring and recruitment. But at the end of the day, you still need to know who you're working with. You still need to recruit the person. You need to have a phone call with them. Um, and so that's why, and not to knock what you guys are doing at all, because there's certainly a place for it. But from an agency perspective, we're talking to the influencers. We have their phone numbers. We can text them. We can have those relationships with them. So we know they are real people. We know that the messages are getting communicated and the campaigns are 
are going to be successful. Um, if they're not, we're on the phone to them within two seconds and ask them what the fuck they're doing. Why is that hashtag not in that post? <laughs> and it's very difficult to do that with, with the platforms and the marketplaces that are out there. And, and the or that, you're saying the commodity, the, you don't get on the phone with porn. And <laughs> I, I think is it a commodity or is it a well, it's, it's, it's a commodity in the sense yes. that it's it's a commodity in the sense that um, you have hundreds of options you know i could choose between 50 different coffee vendors you know i can you know and it's it's consolidating the fact that you know back in the day when i would do a deck for png and i'd have to put like 50 people on it they always ended up liking the same 10 people it's always the same usual suspects we'd always say right and then they really would fall in love with one person then i have to neg negotiate with some guy from william morris for two months it sucks because they have you over a barrel. Your client is dying to have this person. They want to be with that person. Influencer changes that, you know? And, and when I say treating like commodity, it means that, all right, you don't want it? Great, I'm gonna go find 100 other people that have the same audience just like you, and I'm gonna use them. I mean, also, for example, um, all right, actually towards the ladies in the room, uh, how many of you are following Kate Upton on social media? Kate Upton, the Sports Illustrated model Kate Upton. How many of you are following? Exactly, but she was the face of Brown Cosmetics. Who made that decision? We're not buying cosmetics, right? So that being said, another example of someone who wanted to settle the, oh, she's the one, uh, uh, done. Micro-influencers. But I, th I think when you say commodity, it, it's, it's, it, it's obviously more, more of a rough way to say that, but like in, in general, while, well, there's not necessarily one person that we have to work with unless unless you do want it to be a face of a brand or, or an, uh, an evangelizer of your brand. I think, you know, it, it still boils down to kind of what this conference is about, which is the authentic voice. So I think that's still going to be important no matter how many tools you have in place. If, if you don't have the tools in place to, to do like the, the analysis of their content, then you are still going to need a person that's able to ensure that the influencers you reach out to is going, going to represent the brand in the, in the, the, the way that you need it. All right. Uh, that wraps it up, guys. We ha these panelists will all uh, be here available to answer many more questions afterwards. And so uh, if you have any questions, feel free to come up and talk to them. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely.